Šobrīd pieslēdzamies Zviedrijai, kur mūs sveiks un stāstīs par koksnes izmantošanas nozīmi klimata pārmaiņu mazināšanā doktors Pīters Holmgrīns. Hello, Peter Holmgrīn, are you online? Hey, thank you very much. Um, can you hear me all right? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, good. You can start. Thank yeah, thanks. And thanks for this opportunity to speak at this Latvian conference. Um, I want to share some experiences from primarily the Swedish forest industries and the Swedish forest sector um, as regards how we see the benefits of forestry and forest products in the climate change efforts and uh, a focus would be on, on substitution uh, that is i think it was covered a bit in, in the previous presentation but that is of course um, when we use wood-based products instead of fossil-based ones but there is an important point to start this discussion with and that is that what is the question really that will determine um, very much what the answer will be First of all, um, it, there is a better word than substitution that we can use, that is displacement. Um, displacement has a little bit more general meaning, and by that we mean how much fossils do we displace with our wood-based products, that is how much fossils can stay in the ground, um, which is of course an immediate climate benefit. Um, and, and there is no doubt that, that this substitution or displacement effect is very significant. Um, IPCC and also the Joint Research Center of the EC, they, they view substitution um, as part of their models. But very often they only look at it as an effect on the margin, because this is how it is applied in, in different um, climate scenarios. But as we can see in the green part of this, this uh, slide, for a valid analysis of the complete climate effect of wood-based products, we need to turn the question around. Instead of asking what the marginal effect of more wood products would be, we should instead ask the question, if our current wood-based products disappeared from the market, what quantity of fossil or cement emissions would be needed to replace these products? Then the, the, um, uh, the question becomes much more obvious and, and also it makes it much easier to analyze the consequences of a, of a reduced supply of wood-based products. Um, because when we look at it, then we can easily conclude that all wood-based products help reduce the demand for fossils or cement emissions. Um, this is true for solid wood products, that's perhaps the most obvious. Um, substitution or displacement when we build houses in wood instead of cement, steel and, and uh, other materials. But it's also true for fiber products because many packaging materials and packaging solutions will substitute or displace uh, packaging or packaging solutions uh, made by plastics or metal. Um, and so this is also a very significant displacement effect. And not only that, both solid wood products and fiber products deliver another potential displacement effect when they, they reach end of use. That is, when we can burn them for energy and actually get even more displacement effect out of the materials. And then, of course, bioenergy as such, a lot of the round wood becomes bioenergy pretty quickly. And also bioenergy displaces large amounts of uh, fossil emissions. And then some will say that, well, it generates carbon dioxide anyway, and that's true. But the, the point here is that the biogenic carbon emissions circulate back to the forests. It's recycled. And so it doesn't cause any net emissions. Um, so all products from the forest displace fossil amount emissions. And without these products, the fossil emissions will therefore be much, much higher. This is also an argument which is important. We, we should not only look at the forest when we discuss the climate effects, 
it is in fact in the value chain that we see the biggest climate benefits. I'll come back to this later in the presentation. And, and the conclusion is then, of course, that we need to invest in the value chain. Uh, to the right here, you can see some results that I will come back to later. Um, it's a recent study we did on the Swedish forest sector. And we, we compared the historical, actually managed um, development in, in Sweden over 40 years. The point here is that we don't then need to make a model that looks into the future with high uncertainty. Instead, we look at what actually happened. And what actually happened was that the atmosphere was um, the atmosphere carbon dioxide was reduced by 1.84 gigatons of carbon dioxide thanks to the Swedish forest sector during these 40 years. That's a lot of carbon dioxide, considering that the worldwide emissions are about 40 gigatons of carbon dioxide per year. When we compare that with a scenario where we don't harvest, um, we see that this will also have a positive effect on the climate because the, there will be less carbon dioxide in the atmosphere after 40 years. But you, as you can see, the difference is very big. Um, this will be one gigaton carbon dioxide worse than the as actually managed scenario. And the reason for that is to a large extent, the lack of displacement or the foregone displacement in this scenario. All those products that were not delivered onto the market from the forest will instead be replaced by fossil-based materials. And that is pretty much the, the, the difference between these scenarios. So this has a very large effect. No, I'm not sure what's happening here. Okay. Um, the way we want to look at the forest-based sector is like this. It's a circular forest bioeconomy. And we need to see this as a whole, otherwise we will not end up with the right conclusions. There is the forest, of course. We harvest from the forest. That gives us products. It also gives us storage of carbon in harvested wood products, or HWP. Uh, the products are recycled, sometimes several times. And eventually, they reach end of use. And at that point, we can, again, use the material for energy. And all, all of this is done recycled, carbon recycling, through the atmosphere and back to the forest, where we normally, in Sweden, I think in Latvia, and definitely in, in, in the European Union, we have a net sink. We are not harvesting more than, we're harvesting less than the growth, and therefore we have a net sink. So this is, this is the circularity that we need to consider. And in addition to the circularity, we get displacement because those products that we, that we can generate, they displace fossils and stop fossils from being, being um, pumped up into the atmosphere. But, and here's the big but, in climate policy uh, and in IPCC reports, assessments and analysis, um, it was decided long ago, in early 1990s, that the land-based sectors should be treated differently from the rest of the economy. The land-based sectors are reported separately, um, and this means that anything that happens in the forest is not really connected to the products and the displacement and the recycling. Um, this is a sector structure that, that has become very problematic for, for the forest-based sector. And I'll come back to that. Um, I call this the great IPCC wall because it separates the forest from its renewable products. And it's a structural problem. What happens is that if you look to the far left here, um, these structures, they shape the politics, policy, science, and the debate. And to the far left, you have how forests are, are viewed in IPCC's global models. And this is very openly described. You can look at, for example, the, the IPCC land report that was issued two years ago. They consider forestry as the harvest, primarily. 
Um, whereas the sink in the forest is considered a natural response, which means that all the efforts we make to manage the forest are not really counted because it's seen as a natural response. And of course, if you only count the harvest and not the growth, then you will get a big minus. And uh, you get statements like forestry is 11% of the climate problem. Um, this is also stated in IPCC's uh, global reports. Of course, uh, we don't really agree with that. Then you have the middle version. This is how forests are treated in the so-called land use, land use change and forests reporting, which we do, for example, in the European Union and for which there are, are a lot of policies present. Here, the sink is considered, which is an improvement. So we have a harvest from the forest, but we also count the net sink, the growth in the forest. Um, and we also count the, the carbon that is stored in products. This is also good. But still, we don't see the circularity. It's not explicit. The displacement is invisible. And the market drivers of, of the forest development is also invisible. It happens somewhere else. So we don't have what you see to the far right, as I showed you before. We don't see the full, full circular forest bioeconomy in climate policy. And if we did, then we would get a very different perspective on the contributions of forests and forestry to the climate solutions. The consequence of this sector structure can be described as this. Here we have, um, as a starting point, an IPCC net zero scenario. This is quite common. There are different versions, and we've just had the COP26, and they've discussed net zero quite a lot. And in net zero, what usually is the aim is that the fossils, which is the great part in this figure, should be reduced very quickly. But they can't be reduced to zero. So instead, we have something on the other side of the x-axis that compensates for the remaining fossil emissions. And that's the forest. Because in, the, in these models, um, forest is, is mainly a parking place for carbon. And so what we should be doing is to focus the contributions of forests and forest products for displacing fossil emissions to bend that curve downwards. But that's not really what's happening in climate policy. What's happening in climate policy is that we're only looking at the forest as a, carbon play, a parking place for carbon and as a compensation for the remain, remaining um, the remaining fossil emissions. And so it's a suboptimal perspective. And the Glasgow Climate Pact actually repeats this mantra. This is an extract from, from that document where it says that it emphasizes the importance of protecting, conserving, and restoring nature and ecosystems, including forests and other terrestrial and marine ecosystems. And some more text. And then by acting as sinks and reservoirs of greenhouse gases, that's the parking place. It doesn't say anything about what the products deliver. So what happens? then when we harvest a cubic meter of wood. Well, first of all, we need, to, we need to consider that a big part of the tree remains in the forest, the stumps, the roots, in most cases, also the branches. So we are only taking out one, we're only taking out 0.92 tons of carbon dioxide out of 1.375. So we take that out, it becomes round wood, and then it becomes, um, one of two things. Some of it become wood and fiber products. That's about 0.4 out of the 0.9. But the larger part almost immediately is used as bioenergy in one form or another. In Sweden, we're using every, every um, part of, of, the, of the harvested wood. So it's all used. If it's not used for wood and fiber products, then it's used for bioenergy. It's actually a, a larger fraction that goes to bioenergy if you include the sawdust and, and the, and the um, 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 unused uh, material like black liquor and so on in, in the pulp process. 
And of course, the bioenergy becomes emissions. That's adding, adding uh, carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. However, all of these wood products, as I said initially, also displace fossils. And with the current assumptions and approximations we, we have, and those are quite conservative, um, and they're based on the same literature as was shown in the previous presentation, it's actually a zero-sum game in the short perspective, because the displacement is of the same magnitude as the biogenic emissions. So nothing happens with the atmosphere. However, looking at this over time, then we have to take in how much does the forest grow, how much more do we accumulate in the forest, and also how do we, how does the product storage develop and uh, um, how does how does the remaining carbon in the forest decay and so on? And that, that's what we what, what we looked at. So coming back to the displacement, uh, the conservative factors that we use at the moment in most calculations, and they are based on science and uh, compilation of, of uh, uh, published papers and uh, life cycle analysis studies. Um, the factors, and this is measured in tons of fossil carbon displaced by a ton of carbon in the forest-based product. For solid wood products, it's 1.5. So for each ton of carbon in, in wood products, 1.5 tons of fossil carbon can stay underground. For fiber products, we assume a lower level of about 0.7 and the same level for the marketed bioenergy. And note here that we're not counting the bioenergy that is used in the process. We're only counting the bioenergy that is sold on to, to be used as energy in, in heating or electricity or in liquid biofuels. Um, if we then look at the Swedish forest estate and, and what's happened on it and over the past 70 years, then we can see that, first of all, we haven't depleted the growing stock. On the contrary, we've increased the growing stock by 57% since 1955. And that currently stands at 3.3 billion cubic meters. At the same time, during this period, we've harvested 4.5 billion cubic meters. So here it's becoming obvious that, that Yes, it's good that we're storing carbon in the forest and we're actually increasing that storage. But it's even more important that we harvest so much and all the, all the benefits for the climate that we can get from all that wood is, of course, uh, very large. So we, we took all these numbers and we made an analysis for the Swedish forestry sector as a whole. Um, and um, looked at it on an annual basis. And on an annual basis, we concluded that the carbon sink in the forest, the net sink in the forest, was about 55 million tons of carbon dioxide for Sweden as a whole, which happens to be about the same as our territorial emissions, emissions um, uh, from fossils. So the forest compensates all our ter territorial emissions as such. But then we also add the displacement. Uh, from the products that we generate. And that actually accounted to another 42 million tons of carbon dioxide. And then we deducted the fossil emissions that the forest-based sector is making in the value chain. They're not very large anymore because most of the process is now fossil free. It's using bioenergy mostly. Um, but there is there are still some emissions in the transportation sector and, and uh, that has to be deducted. But the total is not plus 93, almost twice our territorial emissions. And, and this is, of course, amazing that, that the, the structures that I mentioned before makes this number invisible. It's not really acceptable, in my view. This is another view of, of the Swedish climate situation. Um, the red uh, bars illustrate different uh, perspectives on our emissions. To the far right, we have the consumption emissions, which is about 10 tons per capita in Sweden at the moment. 
and that's of course too high. The third bar is the territorial emissions I mentioned. It's about five tons per capita in Sweden, and that's lower than the EU average, and it's, it's about the same as the global average, and that's because we have a lot of bioenergy in our system. Then you have to the far right, the forest-based sector, and the big plus we get from, from the forest-based sector. So you can see that this is, this is really a, an amazing factor in, in, the, in Swedish society. So we did another study because there's, oh, many say that, yeah, yeah, that's fine. The forest grows and, and it accumulates carbon and we get some products and that's good too. But um, we don't have time. It's the next 10 years that we have to solve the climate issue. And it's in the next 10 years, we need to make sure that the carbon dioxide is, is, is um, reduced in the atmosphere. And then some argue that the best way to, to do that with the forest is to stop harvesting or reduce harvesting, because then the carbon will remain in the forest and it will not be emitted through bioenergy and, and, and other things. Um, and so, we didn't really believe in that. So we wanted to put some, some numbers to, to that analysis and see what happens. And you recognize this figure from, from the beginning of my talk. Um, if you look at the developments in this case over 40 years, and this is known data, we know how the forest developed over these years, we know how much we harvested, we know how much products we made, and we know how much, much fossil emissions was used in, in, in the value chain. Um, the carbon changes in essentially three places. I mentioned already that it changes in the atmosphere, and we had a great reduction in the atmosphere over these 40 years. It changes in the lithosphere, that is the fossil deposits, and we do use some fossil emissions in the value chain. I mentioned that already. So we have a small arrow coming up from, from the fossil deposits into the atmosphere. And then it changes in the biosphere, and this is, of course, the growing forest that becomes bigger. It, it contains more carbon, much more carbon after 40 years than at the beginning of this period. But this is also the storage of carbon in, in, in the products that I also mentioned before. So this is both the living and the dead biomass. Some of it actually is in the soil too, and the soil also increases. Um, so this, was, this is what actually happened. And then, we, as I also mentioned before, when we compared that with a scenario of where we didn't harvest anything, we would get still a positive result, but a much less positive result in, in the atmosphere. Now I'm going to go into some more detail on, on why, what is actually happening here. These are the same two scenarios. Um, and it illustrates to the left, the uh, as actually managed scenario, you can see that the biosphere, that's the forest and the products and all that, it's, it's expanding all the time over these 40 years. So we have a lot more carbon stored in the biosphere at the end of the period. We have the small fossil emissions, and then as a balance, we have the atmosphere removals. Um, and if you, comp if you compare that with the right figure, which is the one where we don't harvest, if we don't harvest, then the forest will grow really fast in, in, to start with, because these are well-managed forests. But eventually, and actually fairly soon, uh, the forest will be, will be uh, there will be damages to the forest. There will be insects, there will be fires, there will be windfalls, and we will not expand the forest as quickly in the last, later part of the period. Of course, since we have a uh, the large fossil emissions from, from uh, in this scenario, because we have to replace all those products, the balance of the atmosphere removal would be much smaller, as you see here. An important point with this graph is to, to, that we can, you can see that the atmosphere removals is smaller throughout the 40-year period. That is, even after these crucial 10 years, it is a worse scenario to, to not harvest, because the atmosphere removals will be smaller. So even if it is urgent to solve the climate problems, 
stopping harvesting in the forest is not a solution. On the contrary, it would make things worse. So, and this is my last slide, where do we need to go next? Well, I think one of my key messages is that we need to move beyond seeing the forest as a parking place for carbon and a carbon that stands in, in the forest and then can be traded and compensating fossil emissions somewhere else. This is a very limited perspective and it's counterproductive. This means that we, we need to recognize that forest offsets selling credits, carbon credits from the forest uh, to achieve net zero political or corporate goals as a fake solution doesn't change anything um, because, yes, you're storing more carbon in the forest, uh, but then you're selling credit so somebody else can continue to emit fossils instead. So that's a zero-sum game. And as I've shown in this presentation, it's even a negative game because instead of those um, harvested forest products, um, you will need even more fossil emissions to compensate for them. So instead, what I think we need to achieve is that we move the climate value of the forest from the, the standing wood and the standing carbon in the forest. We, move, we have to move that to the products and we need to realize that value that, that, that the wood-based products deliver um, in terms of climate solutions. Only then will it be possible to, to develop um, the climate benefits from the forest and, and move away from this IPCC Great Wall situation that we have today. So what we need is a revenue stream, an income stream for avoided fossil emissions through displacement substitution. So if, if we know that, or can estimate that um, a, a wooden building um, leads to much less fossil emissions, then somehow the value of displacing those fossil emissions should be, should be paid. Um, this is uh, going to be difficult to achieve, but uh, it's time to talk openly about the, the um, strange situation that forests and forest-based products have ended up in when it comes to climate policy. So I'll stop there. Uh, thank you. And I hope it was uh, comprehensive and understandable at your end. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Holmgren. Uh, all the questions, what we will receive, we will send you. And afterwards, it will be uh, possible to answer them in the written form. For now. Mm. Thank you very much. Oh, sounds good. Thank you.